The Clone Wars Season 3 Thoughts. So, spoilers for everything Star Wars leading up to and including this particular season in this video. So, yeah, I continue to love each episode and season of this so far. This video will be my riffs and anal analysis for the season. It's now review. I will do a spo spoiler free review once I've watched all seasons. Since I won't get into the following in every single episode section in this video, I will just briefly say every episode so far has great creativity and designs. The action is engaging, varied, and well choreographed. I'm invested in the stories and characters. Anything I don't comment on, presume I approve of. N not everything I say will be, like, negative, but yeah. And let's see. Um, so... That brings let's let's start with the very first episode of the season entitled Clone Cadets. So So yeah, in the first two seasons, unless I'm forgetting something, we didn't see a single droid go from separatist to you know being in favor of the Republic. Essentially you know, you could read into it that, the according to the show, according to the first two seasons, droids are either good or bad, even though we've seen clones be more independent. One changed side to separatist, another retired from war. But yeah, this season does have it for droids. I suppose you could say that they were reprogrammed more than that they changed their mind, but R2 led several battle droids. And they did still express individuality. You know, one of them, like, smacks him to sell it. And then apologizes once they're alone. And another says, it's been an honor to serve you. So, yeah, I appreciate. There we go. And so, yeah, we meet the Domino Squad before they passed the test. And some of them have passed in the other way. Brick with the massive brain looks like that one Star Trek alien species, and he's referred to by cadets as Master Chief, so I guess someone's a Halo fan. We get another THX 1138 reference. I really appreciate the cinematography. You know, in, in this episode, like, on the final attempt where they passed, the camera makes it clear they are now working as a unit. Compare it to the earlier attempts, the camera would focus on the arguing between them, and now the camera is at a distance, so you can really take in how well they function. You know, like, if you showed someone, if they, if you showed someone who had no idea about Star Wars, just the scene of them passing, they might think, oh, I guess the clones have, like, a hive mind, because they're, you know, they're working together perfectly as a unit. You're one of us, 99. Google gobble. 99 got the heavy metal. And that brings us to episode 2, Arc Troopers. It's cool watching Obi-Wan rescue himself. Why did he choose a vessel with so little in the way of weapons that he needs to get so creative? The squid droids are very cool. When they started drilling, I really started to think of Matrix 2 and 3, though. I'm really glad that 99 does not go the 300 route, that they didn't make him Ifialtes. It's important to have positive representation of disabled people. Not only does Ventress kill the trooper, she gives him the kiss of death. And she tells Grievous, there is nothing you could possibly give me. So her evil is very gendered. And let's see, we see child-aged cadets fighting battle droids with weapons. Going further than season two, again, we are basically seeing children groomed to be soldiers. And yes, I know, I know, they're not going to be, like, I forget what it was they said, but there was some kind of growth acceleration. So it's not quite the same as real children, you know, the, the or non-clone children. It's still, I, I still find it kind of uncomfortable. Very dramatic when 99 dies. I really appreciate he went out fighting. Very tense fight over the DNA bottle thing. And next episode... 
supply lines. Jar Jar is less frustrating here than he was in Season 1. I really appreciate that here the Tordarians are not anti-Semitic stereotypes when Watto was in the movies. It's wild seeing Jar Jar with the slapstick so under control, but I like it better than when it's out of control. He does legitimately, like, he manages to, to distract them, you know, in this episode. While obviously I don't enjoy watching Jedi die, I do wish the show would either not have them survive so many ridiculous situations, or preferably not put them in so many situations they shouldn't be able to survive. So I do appreciate that, you know, the at least one Jedi dies in this episode. And, yeah, later in this season also, they, you know, the some of the, yeah, I just got done watching the season finale, and that one had, oh, Hold on, did any... Uh, actually, yeah, maybe it was the episode before that one, but Siz Khalifa did die. Even though she was a major character with a name and character development. And they've do, done that for some of the clones as well. But, you know, in, for a while of this show, it did kind of feel like, oh, I guess only clones are going to die almost exclusively. And that's, again, considering that part of the show is humanizing the the faceless troopers yeah this episode stresses the importance of food and medicine to civilizations during wartime something absent from a lot of fiction about war and it also has a neutral nation realize they have to get involved it takes the senate years to decide on anything it took them several decades just deciding the shade of gray for the chairs and next episode, Sphere of Influence. More of the people from the planet of Pantora. Return of the Smurfs. I'm not sure how I feel about the goat alien. I kind of have to respect that they literally did make it bleat. The inspector continues to be irritating like last season, but now he's also useless. I didn't really feel like he was useless last time. And Ahsoka gets onto a Trade Federation space station. They are really bad at keeping secret Jedi off them. And I liked Ahsoka getting both of them past the bouncer. It was a little silly, but I mean, you know, in part it is a good show that, you know, she basically does have to do the mind trick for both of them individually, but yeah. The Honorable Jabba, Jabba is willing to allow a blood test of Greedo. Just please do it off screen so we don't get in trouble with the censors. Tense and suspenseful when one is pointing a gun at Greedo. And I appreciate this episode acknowledging how dirty politics sometimes get. Which, you know, in general, that I'm not saying it's the first episode of this show to do that. Corruption. Vampire, snake, pharaoh, alien species. I really respect, like, I think it was, uh, uh, what do they call, or oral knots that, that said, oh, you know, a lot of these aliens are basically, like, they, they combine to actual real-life beings. Here they actually, yeah, vampire, snake, pharaoh, that's, yeah, Im impressively creative. Children almost died because our government couldn't be trusted. In real life, countless people have died because of government incompetence when it came to handling dangerous situations. And since the show first aired, we saw it with COVID. The Academy. Satine points out that apparently the you know Prime Minister doesn't want new ideas for children's education. Which is, you know, a problem in some, yeah. I realize CRT was after this episode first aired, but that was definitely something that it made me think about. And, you know, yeah, before, like, Republicans have prevented, you know, the teaching of, you know, just how important people of color have been to American history and try to tone down the, the bad things in America's past. I like when Tano and the kids discuss corruption. And 
Ahsoka and the kids try the fake arrest trick, which, you know, has... The, that has worked other times in Star Wars. But the PM had set a trap. I appreciate the detail that Ahsoka could only dodge blasts from the stun gun once she was aware of it. Like, the first time she did get hit, and then, then you know, after that she knew how it was coming. Now, I appreciate the catharsis inherent in revenge fantasies, but when Ahsoka not only put the shock collar on the Prime Minister, at that point, honestly, it's fine if the threat is all, but no. She goes ahead and presses the button and gives him a shock. We're supposed to celebrate it, even though it is torture. I get the poetic justice of it, but I just I feel like it shouldn't have gone further than the threat in the whole. And that brings us to Assassin. And so yeah, throughout this episode, Ahsoka is having visions, struggling to find out exactly when and where the attack will take place, which was a fun kind of, you know, we've seen, like, you know, Anakin, for example, has some very troubling visions. And and here to to turn it into like a a kind of mystery of like trying to figure out because we're right there with her trying to figure out when is the attack going to take place. So yeah, the season three focuses more on character development and atmosphere than action, and explores more complex ideas, more moral grays. It was clever to have a droid in place of Padme and very tense and suspenseful when Ahsoka, Aura, and Padme are in the one room, the door is locked, and Padme manages to stun Aura. She continues to be a crack shot, which I really appreciate, and it is revealed that Zero was the one behind this. And... Next episode, Evil Plans. It's nice to see 3PO actually in a situation that he is perfect for him. Holy crap, they start out talking about four credits, end up at 32. This guy really knows how to drive up prices. <coughs> and R2 goes through the droid wash. I love that C-3PO tells Cad Bane he could do with some more etiquette. Holy crap, Cad Bane is really being paid a lot for this mission. He might actually be able to afford Joba fruit. If he really wants to go wild, maybe an egg. I like seeing all the hot heads, very godfather. Poor C-3PO doesn't remember the events, but he is really happy that Padme praised him. That's sweet. You know, he gets yelled at a lot throughout the entire Star Wars. Yeah. Next episode, Hunt for Zero. Quinlan Voss is coded as coded as indigenous visually. We later find out he's excellent at tracking. I kind of wish that the voice reflected that, but this is still great for representation. You know, comparatively, like, they're not trying to hide the, the you know, something like the movie Prey, which I, you know, obviously it's not for children. Do not show that to a child. But that movie, you know, yeah. In that movie, like with Quinlan Voss here, visually, clearly indigenous, but in that, they aren't toning down the, the voices. Until I realized she was going to kill him for breaking her heart, which is a sexist trope, I did find it kind of sweet The Zero and the singer are or were in love, and I liked how she used trickery to get into the cell area. They actually did a record scratch when the Jedi entered the hut area, the hut hut. And Zero's mother calls Cad Bane Chad something. He definitely does have Chad energy. As usual, really enjoyed the bounty hunter action. And that brings us to the next episode. Heroes on both sides. Deregulation of banks is shown as an evil, like it is in real life. I really wish the Bank and Clan guy was redesigned. He remains anti-Semitic, like in Attack of the Clones. I forget if he even showed up in Revenge of the Sith. I appreciate the episode pointing out that politics aren't always black and white. Not sure it was necessary to have that exact phrasing multiple times in the episode, but nevertheless. 
the moment I saw Lux, I knew they were going to have him and Ahsoka be attracted to each other or something. The show wasn't as annoying about it as I worried. I don't think it was necessary to have him ogle Ahsoka. Certainly, it felt like an excuse for a POV male gaze. If what you want to get across is that he's being inappropriate, just have him say a compliment that is out of line or something, you know. Let's see. You know, as it is, like, I feel like, you know, if, if like, a teenage girl watches this episode, she might feel like, oh, I guess there really is nothing I can do when a guy stares at me, you know, when just, yeah. Not a fan of that aspect. Another episode with war profiteers. In this, they are literally better off financially if the war keeps going. The infiltration droids have a Terminator vibe. I do wish that it wasn't an intentional suicide attack, since Americans are primed to think of that kind of thing as connected to Islam and kamikaze pilots. Obviously, Islamist suicide attacks are horrible, but that's something that's been communicated in American media outlets countless times since 9-11 and a number of times before it. So far, except for that aspect, the show has been doing a good job focusing on the wrong done on the American side to provide some more even commentary. And next episode, Pursuit of Peace. While it's true that crises are sometimes taken advantage of by greedy people, I really wish it wasn't the anti-Semitic alien doing it. I like the design of the two fish alien bounty hunters. And the speeder ride was very tense. Really appreciated that th through Tekla they go into all the social issues worsened by crises like wartime. Again, something that too often American media in favor of war does not acknowledge. Next episode, Night Sisters. So, yeah, we see Dooku reject Ventress. Great fights in this episode. And... You know, R R two goes up to to Obi Wan in the ship, and Obi Wan's like, D -d 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 "Don't point that thing at me when I'm not on fire, because I feel like I'm gonna spontaneously combust." And Dathomir has nothing but fog and witches. I guess it's directed by John Carpenter. We get Ventress's backstory, including Jedi training before meeting Dooku. You know, she does legitimately have a very tragic backstory. You don't. Like, you, you understand how she ended up where she is. So, witchcraft is traditionally seen as female, and in fact, Wicca was basically early feminism and was demonized as being dangerous because women were taking control of their lives without men. So, yeah, I, I quite appreciated th this episode. Like, it would have been so boring if, like, it was basically, yeah, yeah, it's the same as, you know, if, if it was basically just let's say, just more Sith, for example, you know, which the, the, I suppose the whole Jedi Sith, Sith thing, I'm, I'm not sure if that's necessarily very, very gendered, although most, both Jedi and Sith appear to be male, especially in the movies, but yeah, the, the, you know, Wicca definitely is seen as, as, you know, yeah, female, and, and was originally. So, so yeah, this episode might, you know, get some some girls or teenage, yeah, young, young women to start considering, you know, wait, have I been lied to about witchcraft? You know, is, is there something here? And, you know, I guess not everybody had a cell phone back when this episode originally aired, but Google was a thing, so yeah, it might get them to look more into Wicca. Similar to something like Charmed. Now, next episode is Monster. I guess I didn't notice it watching the episode before this one, but I did from here on. Love this sort of echo effect on Mother. Really reminds me of a similar thing in the first two Thief games. People who've played them probably know what characters I mean. For the people who haven't, I do not want to spoil, but yeah. Absolutely loved. It It really has this... Like, it feels like she's not just an individual. There is, like... There, there's more... 
I suppose maybe there's more life than you would necessarily think from just looking at her. She looks like a person, but there's, you know, yeah, so I quite appreciate that. I love hearing a matriarch say the words, men are easy to get, but difficult to control. So many patriarchs talk about women in similar terms. Children can be exposed to the idea that matriarchs think similarly, and it might, may, might make boys empathize more with girls. The selection process and Ventress's test are brutal. I like the detail that the guy in charge is completely okay with it, like, going like this. Presumably, this is how it always goes. And, yeah, there's obviously similarity to Darth Maul. And Savage is really cool. Such hatred. I know, it's like if a Republican wasn't a pants-pissing baby. And the magic changes Savage, and when order he kills Feral, despite earlier saying as long as he was alive, Feral wouldn't be killed. So clearly, it completely changed him. Great character moment. And Savage Opress really kicks ass at the temple on Edith. And Dooku expresses wanting to rule, taking power from Sidious with Savage. So, yeah, again, that, you know. Yeah, Sith legitimately are always trying to take power from the, you know, the the Darth Vader expressed the same thing. Next episode, Witches of the Mist. So we see Dooku train Savage, and the Jedi are going to try to track down Savage. I mean, with those horns, clearly, suspect is hatless. Repeat, hatless. Great fights on Toydaria, a planet named after two great things, toys and Daria. And on Dooku's ship or something like that, and Ventress and Savage fighting Dooku two on one, then Savage fighting them one on two, and some fights involving Jedi and Savage. Very, very cool. And we find out that Mole survived and is in exile, which they don't do more with this season, but I guess that's coming up. And that brings us to episode 15, Overlords, which I gotta say, the moment that I can't read that word without thinking, spawn more overlords. So for parts of this episode, Ahsoka is basically just stating the obvious, we're getting pulled into that thing, the ship is gone. That last one, Obi-Wan even points out. Don't need to state the obvious here. I like all the mystery early in this episode. I quite like the Prince of Persia, the Forgotten Sands, we vibe to the place. Though it's probably just that both of them were inspired by the same source. The father, son, and daughter's speech is riddled with, well, riddles. Actually, yeah, the, the Prince of Persia game probably came out right around the same time as this uh, aired, so... Not sure they could even be inspired by each, I, that either of them could be inspired by the other. Qui-Gon, Shmi, and Ahsoka from the future appear in Visions. Did they bring back Pernilla Algos for Shmi from the movies, or is someone in the cast just doing a dynamite impression of her? Certainly, the impersonation of Natalie Portman is about spot on. And, let's see. so yeah, the Force wielders... And yeah, it was it was interesting seeing this like different side to the force. And they try to force Anakin to make the superhero choice, and as happens with a lot of these, he chooses both. Let's see. I, f I feel like just once I would just I get it. I get that you don't want to make the character look bad, but I I'm not sure I've seen even a single one where they actually made the choice, where they actually said Okay, I can't. I can't just choose both. Great action. I appreciate this episode's version of what balance of the force means. And next episode, Altar of Mortis. And you know, the it. You know, the stated goal is we will destroy the Sith and the Jedi, which I. I don't know if this show is going to go much further with that. I suppose I will just say some other Star Wars story has also brought up the concept that you don't have to 
you know, it doesn't have to be either or. I would like to see the the concept explored of, you know, no Sith, no Jedi. It, it would be very different for the the main, you know, yeah, mainstream Star Wars. Legitimately very creepy when Ahsoka is infected by the sun, and the voice actor does a great job with the creepy thing. They even have her do that thing where she'll be really cheery some of the time, and then, like, not just, yeah. Son, don't do this. Do we have to fight every Thanksgiving? He who wields the blade controls my brother. I guess Marvel better figure out who's directing that movie soon. More great fighting. I like the point made that at its core, goodness is selflessness. Evil is selfishness. And... Next episode, Ghosts of Mortis. Do you read? You mean like books, not menus and billboards, right? What did he show you? Revenge of the Sith preview. Nothing is set in stone. Oh yeah, what about the Ten Commandments, smart guy? We were gone for more than a minute. The Force wielders did it all in one day. They can do anything they like, of course they can. And next episode, The Citadel. It's do or draw, die. There is no try. I love the design of the commander alien. Very creepy. Holy crap, this is a difficult mission for them. And we meet a young Tarkin. And next episode, Counterattack. A probe droid, just like in Empire Strikes Back. Very cool. And the new escalation is the commando droids have deflective shields. And Ahsoka uses some of the explosives to blow them, them up. And then some to blow up the walls. Not needing a side mission to make sure she has enough to blow up the walls. Unlike a certain Deus Ex. Let's see. To be clear, I love Deus Ex. In this episode, we see that evil executes prisoners of war. And I like Tarkin and Anakin agreeing. That's a good hint of just what's to come. Very moving clone deaths. And... Next episode, Citadel Rescue. These couple of apps do in fact feature droids that are good. Really glad one can walk away from the show saying not all droids are bad in prequel Star Wars. You know, other than the ones we already met. I mean, in, in the original trilogy, obviously. So they use attached cables to move from the top of the rock down the sheer surface. That's repelling. Tarkin's philosophy is debated among the Jedi. Spider droids, and they climb up. Very creepy, and love the lava and the hounds. Like, it, this episode gets very intense, and just, yeah... Tarkin insists he will only tell the information to Palpatine. Ahsoka will only tell the Jedi Council. And Tarkin and Anakin shake hands. The Imperial March plays. Absolutely love it. And next episode, Padawan Lost. Is that a title reference to Lightsaber Lost? since both are about Ahsoka. So this episode has a handful of former youngs in most dangerous game predator kind of thing. That's, yeah, that's pretty good. Ho, 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 now Ahsoka has a blaster. We were beginning to for forget who we are. Now she's got amnesia! And Ahsoka does manage to kill the son of one of them. I think he got the point. And the finale, Wookie Hunt. So, let's see. The I'm not sure I have more to say about the... Yeah, I, I do think this, episode, this, this season does a little better on... Having, you know, major characters die on the good side that, you know, aren't, not not all of them are clones. 
so the the you know I feel like the the original trilogy it feels like major characters could actually die and then in the prequels well actually no, yeah not the prequel movies so much the 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 thing with the prequel movies is that the Jedi are so powerful and then in this show the Jedi are even more powerful than they are in the prequel movies so I appreciate making you know get, getting the threat back into the now let's see so ranked worst to best keeping in mind I love all of them they're all amazing I'm ranking how much I love them not whether or not I love them all overall actually yeah I'll just yeah overall season finale and season opener all of you know all the way worst to best season one season two and season three it just keeps getting better and better so that's very very cool and I got a couple of critic quotes so the let's see the bad lack of significant character development and I'm, I'm not sure I would go quite that far but there I suppose there could have been more of it and let's see Season 3 features several episodes before the appearance of Ahsoka Tano. When she does appear, she is less Anakin's Padawan, more her own person. That's very true. Let's see. This season is solidly entertaining, illustrates a much more realistic sense of the consequences and reach of the war than the prior seasons did. And... Yeah, the, this season has the scope and political acumen of an adult commentary on the nature of war. In fact, during one episode, all I could think was it was unfortunate George Lucas and her team had not made similar statements back when they might have mattered, like 2003. It's much easier to make edgy political statements when the administration has changed. Very true. But yeah, um, I don't think I have anything else to say. Um... Yeah, the show keeps getting better and better. Really psyched to, you know, I'll probably watch, start watching season four either later today or tomorrow. And tomorrow I will be doing a video on the, you know, the episode that airs tomorrow of The Mandalorian season three. I guess episode two of season three. And yeah, you know, the, the, yeah, a lot of great. Star Wars, so that's that's really good. And oh wow, I actually holy crap! I almost forgot. Well, I I forgot again. I just didn't this time. I didn't turn off the camera before I I even made sure to write it here. Anyway, those were general notes. These I I do have some notes specifically for the episode Wookie Hunt. So yeah, a very tense and suspenseful episode. I quite appreciate the the surprise attack on the dropship. I really like how you know the good guys attack and they don't win right away and you know at times it looks like they might straight up completely lose and you know Siz Khalifa did die in the I believe the second to last episode of this season so you know and I got to say when the dropship crashed and we're seeing like Ahsoka and I gotta say I didn't remember the names of the others, but the other Jedi younglings, you know, with the with it crashing in the background, like dust being kicked up, that really made me think of something similar in the movie Aliens, which also included a dropship. So I gotta, I feel like that's gotta be a, a reference. And yeah, we have Chewie, Crunchy, and. Yeah, you know, so so Ahsoka could stare down the leader of them and say, We have a Wook. E. Great fights. I really appreciate the weight to them. Like the the Jedi younglings are exclusively smaller and have less muscle mass, less weight behind them than I gotta say, I don't remember the species, but the lizard people, aliens, you know. And yeah, the the lizard aliens. You know, when when Chewie Chewie can like 
pick them up or hit really hard or knock them over or th those kinds of things but the the Jedi younglings they struggle each time I really appreciated that detail you know even with the force like if if you're fighting someone who has much more muscle mass and weighs a lot more than you you know and they didn't make it gendered which you know I, I really hate when that kind of thing gets turned into a misogynist kind of thing because the you know some women are musclier than some men it's not anyway you know the the Ahsoka is you know and Sis Khalifa are, are female but the other two Jedi younglings um, I guess I might have started out with more than two, but the two that are still alive by this episode, you know, they, they appear to be male, and they also struggle, so I appreciated that. And let's see, yeah, it looked like they were really, you know, they were basically, they were surrounded, they were maybe about to get captured, and then the, you know, the other Wookiees come in, and it ends with Ahsoka thanking Anakin for the training and he doesn't make like a big you know petty thing out of oh so now you can thank me but graciously accepts uh, you know so yeah I, I like that Chewie was you know accurately characterized we see you know he the the you know um, gearhead thing you've got the you've got the um, the anger and the you know the very effective application of violence you know because like I actually I have no idea how how Wookiees age because technically let's see this is before the events of Revenge of the Sith and then after Revenge of the Sith you have like I think it's like 20 years before the events of A New Hope. So yeah, I, I don't know if this is supposed to be like teenage Chewbacca or something, but you know, yeah, he's got he's got muscle mass, he's he's heavy. He already knows how to you know, do a lot of stuff with with tech and so so yeah, I I appreciated that and in in this Similar to uh, Solo, a Star Wars story, he came across as more like a person and less like a really smart dog. Which, like, I I get it. Like, it's you know, I I didn't watch Star Wars when I was a kid, but if I had, I probably would think it was super cool that they had a dog walk on two feet and talk and that this kind of thing. You know not not galactic basic but speak in a way that others could understand not only like bark and growl which you know we can we can try to surmise but we can't like it can't communicate ideas the way that chewie can in in star wars so i get that but like i you know i just rewatched empire strikes back and like Luke like scratches it behind the ears which like just imagine if like a friend of yours is saying goodbye to you and scratches you behind your ears like if you don't you know if you think of him as a person like that's not something that would usually like like that's the kind of thing a dog likes to to receive you know from from not only its owner but also friends of the owner kind of thing you know so but, but yeah, um, great episode, great season, really looking forward to, uh, you know, where they go next, really loving the, the kind of darkness of it, like, with, with Savage, that got very, very dark, uh, you know, you know, there's, there's always been some darkness in this show, and certainly there's always been darkness in Star Wars, but the, you know, like, I, th I think if, if you haven't watched A New Hope in a while, like, if you go back, like, there's a lot of murder in that movie, you know, the, the, like, frequently it's off screen, sure, but we'll, like, see the dead bodies, you know, that's, like, you know, the, the, you know, in addition to, to Owen and Baru, you know, you have all those, uh, uh what are they called, um, 
the the uh, Wutini people. I, f I forget what they're called. The they pick apart droids and sell them. Jawas, you know the the yeah, like there's a scene where they come across like a lot of dead Jawas, and it's like dark. So I appreciate that you know yeah here we are getting really dark and you know I I think some people underestimate how much darkness children can like like obviously you know don't show them like a horror movie you know but or or at least not one that's for like adults you know you I guess you could show them Halloween Town if you, you know they need to be punished for something but I'm kidding that movie's perfectly to tolerable just they're they're much better out there but yeah you know I I would say again I'm not sure I would show this to someone who's younger than like 10 but yeah I I would argue a 10 year old could probably handle this season and you know at some point they do have to start learning that there is darkness in the world so that they can help stop it you know I get this idea of you know wanting to keep your kids from knowing these things but they're gonna have to learn eventually and a lot of things the sooner you start teaching the the you know like children children's brains are sponges like it's a it's wild how much they can learn in a in a way that just you know adult brains are are not quite as you know anyway um yes so absolutely love the season really psyched to see more yeah that's that's it so may the force be with you